can airplanes fly over hurricanes? Hurricanes, or hurricanes if you wish, have long been the cause of flight cancellations, especially in regions with severe hurricane seasons. Yet modern aircraft have been designed to withstand much of the challenges brought by such strong storms. Hurricanes are tropical cyclones that generally occur over the Atlantic Ocean and the northeast of the Pacific Ocean. They usually inhabit the area close to the ground. When we say close, we mean like 20,000 to 30,000 feet or so in, in the case of a moderate storm. The majority of the disruption therefore occurs at ground level. Around the storm, airports will close and airlines will not take off or land. But high above the storm itself, it is possible for aircraft to fly over the storm. Meteorologist and pilot James Adelart previously told the Point Sky that, as far as aviation goes, most tropical systems and hurricanes are generally not as tall as traditional thunderstorms. The tallest convection in a tropical cyclone is usually clustered around the central core of rotation, whether that's just a low pressure or, in a hurricane, an eye. As far as flying goes, there should be no issues flying above a hurricane in an aircraft equipped to monitor radar echo tops. So, if the hurricane is not too tall, then it is, in theory, possible for aircraft to file a flight plan that takes them up and over away from the disruption. However, severe hurricanes can grow much taller, sometimes up to 50,000 feet or more. This would make it impossible to fly over the weather in a commercial aircraft of any kind. Although commercial aircraft from the likes of Airbus and Boeing are perfectly capable of flying over or indeed even through a hurricane, most carriers would prefer not to. It would certainly be a bumpy ride, and although the aircraft won't just fall out of the sky, passengers would probably prefer that the pilots went around. Overflying a hurricane would be incredibly risky for any commercial airliner. If something went wrong, such as an unexpected engine problem or a medical emergency, the options for the pilots would be much more limited. A descent for diversion would be possible, but the airport suitable for landing at would be further away. As well as this, there is the risk of a lightning strike on the airplane. Modern jetliners are designed to withstand lightning strikes. In fact, the US National Weather Service says that commercial flights are hit by lightning at least one to two times per year. With a metal aircraft, the fuselage acts as a Faraday cage, with the electricity carried harmlessly through the exterior. With composite aircraft, conducting elements have been added to direct the current around the fuselage, so there is no danger to passengers from lightning hitting a plane. But in a hurricane situation where multiple lightning strikes are possible, which could interfere with instruments, combined with updrafts of 6,000 feet per minute or more, the airplane is going to be stressed to its absolute maximum. As a result, all commercial airlines will take whatever steps necessary to avoid flying through, or indeed over, an active hurricane. This can be frustrating for passengers, as it can often mean cancelled flights, missed connections, and even days away from home. Airlines in the United States are somewhat disproportionately affected, particularly in the southeast. Just recently, Hurricane Ian led to more than 2,000 cancelled flights across the east coast and major airports shut down. And it doesn't always have to be full-blown hurricanes either. Tropical Storm Nicole saw many airports in the Caribbean and Florida closing and hundreds of flights disrupted. But it's not just the US where storm-related flight disruptions occur. February 2022 saw the arrival of Storm Eunice in Europe, affecting aviation everywhere from the UK to Lithuania. Dutch airline KLM was forced to cancel almost half of its planned services, while other airlines, including British Airways and EasyJet, had dozens of flights delayed. Eunice was particularly notable for the number of crazy diversions seen. A Ryanair flight from Fuerteventura in the Canaries should have been heading to Manchester in the UK, but instead ended up at Bordeaux in France. Another Ryanair flight from La Mezzia Terme in Italy should have been going to London, but was diverted to Oslo in Sweden. And a Pegasus Airlines flight travelled all the way from Ankara in Turkey to Dusseldorf, only to be turned away and to head back halfway across Europe to land in Budapest. Many of these flights attempted to land at their destinations but ended up having to go around or divert entirely, despite being frustratingly close to where they wanted to be. The gusting winds made for some nail-biting approaches, 
many of which were broadcast by the likes of Big Jet TV. It was a challenging event, not only for pilots and airlines, but also for the air traffic control. The UK's National Air Traffic Services, better known as NATS, visualized the patterns of airplanes landing and taking off from Heathrow to give us an idea of the challenges faced on that day. The graphic demonstrates just how many flights were placed in holding patterns as they attempted to land at the airport. Multiple attempts to land were made, with numerous go-arounds being undertaken after failing to touch down. Many of the flights eventually gave up and diverted to other airports. Those that did land had to use all their pilot training to touch down safely, giving passengers a white-knuckle ride on the way in. For airlines, this sort of scenario is a nightmare. Airplanes end up at the wrong airport for later services, displaced passengers need food, accommodation and new flights, and crew need a way to get to their next job. For these reasons, most airlines will seek to avoid operating in extreme weather. But while most commercial aircraft will steer well clear of bad weather conditions, there are some crazy pilots and researchers who do the complete opposite. These pilots fly for the US Air Force Reserve's 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Not only do they fly when there are hurricane conditions present, but they also fly right into the middle of the storm in order to penetrate the eye and collect important data. The 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron is the only military reconnaissance unit in the world and has been sporadically active since 1944 and permanently since 1993. Since 1999, it has operated a fleet of 10 Lockheed WC-130J Weatherbird turboprops, which have a five-person crew and are based at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Alongside these storm chasers are the NOAA team based at Lakeland Linda International Airport in Lakeland, Florida. Colloquially known as Hurricane Hunters, the NOAA uses two Lockheed WP-3D Orion turboprops. With these planes, they fly through the eye at between 500 and 10,000 feet, often several times per mission. The team also has at its disposal a Gulfstream IVSP, which flies around the upper fringes of storms. The aircraft are not reinforced, the wings are standard construction, and there are no special modifications made to the plane. Well, apart from the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of meteorological equipment on board. Hurricane flights typically last about 11 hours. Multiple recordings are made to assess what the hurricane is doing. A standard task involves a sond or a drop sond. It's like a weather balloon except instead of going up, a sond goes down. The sond falls through the weather at 2,500 feet per minute, and on the way down it measures pressure, temperature, humidity and wind speed multiple times a second. We get a nice vertical picture of the atmosphere from the latitude of the aircraft to the surface of the ocean, and that data is relayed via radio in this device back to the airplane. Lieutenant Colonel Drew Clark, a navigator on the Hurricane Hunter planes, told UNCTV Science. This data, along with any visual observations, goes straight to weather stations and meteorologists. It helps forecasters accurately predict what the hurricane is doing, where it is heading, and how severe it'll be. On board the NOAA's P-3 aircraft is a unique array of scientific instrumentation, radars and recording systems for measurements of the atmosphere, the Earth and its environment. They're also equipped with lower fuselage and tail Doppler systems. Mounted to the belly of the aircraft, these systems provide researchers and forecasters an MRI-like look at the storm, allowing them to see all the different layers and internal structure from within the storm. The NOAA's pair of P-3s are the only two of their type in the world. Derived from the Lockheed P-3 Orion, they were delivered as new aircraft in the mid-1970s and are meticulously maintained to keep them going and going. NOAA affectionately calls its aircraft Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy after the famous Muppet characters. The Gulfstream is called Gonzo. During Hurricane Ian, NOAA dispatched its P-3 known as Kermit to investigate the storm. The crew departed Houston Ellington Airport or EFD in the early hours of the morning, flying southeast over the Gulf of Mexico to the Caribbean, where Hurricane Ian was laying waste to the land, air and sea. After roughly two hours in the air, the fearless Kermit penetrated the outermost edge of the hurricane. 
On board was aerospace engineer Nick Underwood, an experienced hurricane hunter who has flown dozens of missions over the last six years. Nick described the experience as the roughest flight of his career, sharing videos of extreme and violent shaking in the cabin. Posting on Twitter, he said, When I say this was the roughest flight of my career so far, I mean it. I have never seen the bunks come out like that. There was coffee everywhere. I have never felt such lateral motion. He later said that the extreme turbulence lasted for at least 10 minutes, but that it felt like an eternity. Despite the challenging conditions, the NOAA aircraft managed to launch a new Altius drone into the eye of the storm, marking the first time this has ever been done. The drone collected valuable information on temperature, pressure, and moisture, giving researchers valuable information not only about Ian, but also about future hurricane events. NOAA said, Missions like these help improve the accuracy of future hurricane models by understanding the storm's track, intensity, and structure. This information also helps NOAA improve the safety of operations and more precisely target future research. Ultimately, these refined models provide better analyses to the National Hurricane Center to create forecasts for the public. Scientists are unsure whether climate change will affect the frequency of hurricanes, but they do believe that the intensity and severity of such events is set to increase. As such, the work done by agencies like the NOAA remains crucial to our understanding of hurricanes and the protection of human life in these extreme weather scenarios. Would you feel comfortable flying over a hurricane? Let us know in the comments below, and thank you for watching. Simple Flying publishes over 150 articles every week. If you're looking for the latest aviation news and insights, visit simpleflying.com.